Welcome to Good Thinking. Welcome, good thinkers from around the world. I am so glad that everyone is here. Welcome to Good Thinking, where we are gathered to take a little bit of time, 30 minutes. We'll try to keep this within 30 minutes or less, hopefully, uh, to set aside all the time we are told what to think so we can think about how to think, to improve our thinking. And today, we're going to think about the concept, the, the concept of idea ownership. I mean, we could do probably, I could probably do five, you know, episodes, a full workshop, got no, 20 keynotes on the idea of ownership, because I think it's a fascinating topic and probably maybe even more fascinating than we give it credit for. But in this case, I think that this rethinking idea ownership might just be something that sets you free. So welcome. Let us know who you are and where you're from in the chat. And remember, this is a conversation versus like a lecture. So all of your chat participation is greatly appreciated and rewarded, will be rewarded with rubber chickens. Wait, how can you see this? Rubber chickens. We've got rubber chickens in the house. So let us know who you are and where you're from, and we will get started. Hopefully, we are streaming. I want to make sure that I can pull all of your comments into the chat. So pretty soon, I'll remove that banner so that we have time for all of your comments. Okay, let's get started. So the first thing before we talk about rethinking idea ownership is to kind of frame this concept of ownership. Because I think that there are, and, and this doesn't come from me, this comes from scholars who look at, you know, the legal aspects and the hist history of ownership. There are kind of six main themes of how you can think about ownership. Now, as I'm going through these, think about the difference between how you think about these for things or stuff versus how you think about these for ideas. Okay. Welcome. We've got our first good thinker. Welcome, Barkley, joining from DC. I am looking forward to you participating in this discussion. So let's get started. I'm going to move, remove the banner and see if we can. And no, we don't want that. There we go. So we have room for all of your comments. Okay. Number one, idea ownership. ownership. The first concept is mine. I had it first. And you can think of a lot of things for that. You know, you could think of I had it first, so it's mine, you have it now. And then that leads to the other one. Mine, I have it now, so it's mine now. And that's a concept of ownership. And these have legal implications, but they also have impl implications for your well-being. So that's what's so interesting. Where are all our good thinkers? Where are the comments? Where are they flowing? Who is, are we even, are we even live? Normally we have people streaming from all over the world. So I never know when I'm going out if this is really, is this is really, Hopefully you're there. All right, so we've got not mine, I had it first. Mine, I have it now. How about this? Mine, I earned it. I earned this. And you could think about it for something you have, an invention or an idea. And then we've got mine. It's attached to something that's mine. And this is, there's a famous one about um, the space in an airplane. You know, like 50% of the people think you can lean your chair back the other 50% say you shouldn't lean your chair back because the airline essentially makes ownership of that space where your tray table is and where your chair can lean back. They make that space ambiguous. They make ownership and big ambiguous. So it's attached to something. And it could be like, what about this? Like if some pizza delivery guy or gal jumps over your fence to deliver pizza to your neighbor, wait a minute. Now that's that's attached that space that he jumped over and he landed on my grass and he ran over to the, you think, well, that you've, you've trespassed. Well, what about Amazon sending a drone across your airspace? Is it your airspace? So that's kind of, it's attached to something that's mine, airspace. How high does it have to be? Well, there are legal things about ownership of airspace, but in our minds, how does that work? Then we've got mine self-ownership, like my DNA. That's mine. It's mine, it's part of me. And then we have got mine family ownership. My family has owned this. So you can start to see that whether it's going back millennia to land or going back to something that you have like a, you know, um, you, you bought or you earned or you think you came up with, you can start to see how there are different ways of thinking about ownership. Now I'm gonna say hi to a few people. This is a, I guess this topic maybe not as enticing to people. I think this is a fascinating topic. I think maybe people might have more fun thinking about 
ownership than they think. Okay, Stephen says, greetings from the ancestral homeland of Multnomah, Clackamas, Chinook, and Tualatin, Kalapuya tribes. Okay, perfect example. Land ownership, histor historical ownership. Ray is here. Welcome, Ray, from Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. All right. So have you ever invented anything? And the follow-on question is, what does it mean to invent something? All right. Do you have to own the patent? Or can you just invent something without concern for getting credit for it? Have you invented anything? We've got LinkedIn user. Yes, so good. So someone says it's fascinating. It's fascinating to me. And I think that once we once we get through this, I think you're going to really find it's liberating as well. It, um, so Stephen says, greetings. Oh, wait, wait, I already got that. Fascinating to me. We already got that. All right. So we're going to get we've got to take that off because we've got that twice. All right. So do do you have to own a patent? Do you have to be recognized as the owner for you to feel a sense of ownership? Yes or no? Because owning an idea can mean turning the idea into a phrase or a drawing or a product so you can attempt to earn a trademark or a patent. This can work with tangible ideas, but what about intangible ideas? Ideas that don't have a physical presence and can exist in multiple places at the same time. What about, okay, so what about ideas? This is the thought experiment. All right, here are my two favorite questions today. And since we are very skinny on participants, hopefully the few participants that are showing up here will participate in this thought experiment. Usually there's so many people scrolling, scrolling, and scrolling that I can't even uh, say hi to everyone. So today we've just got a little intimate group. So thanks for being here. Okay, these are my two favorite questions, all right? Number one, do you have one idea that you want to share with as many people as possible? Like you wish this idea that, more, that more and more people would adopt. You, you just, this is an idea that you really, really want more people to adopt, number one. And number two, if yes, if no, you can say no. If yes, do you, how do you, do you think about this idea as one, your idea, or A, let's say, so you can say A, your idea, or B, someone else's idea. In your mind, what would make any idea your idea? Now, I don't know how many of you used to watch the comedian Sasha Baron Cohen when he, when he did Ali G, but there was one of his many hilarious interviews where he talked about how when the PlayStation first came out, he told his girlfriend about his brilliant idea, a PlayStation 2 that was even better than the PlayStation 1 that had just come out. So a few years later, when Sony launched the PlayStation 2, Ali G blamed his girlfriend for telling Sony about his idea. How many ideas are like that? Well, you know, I mean, there are times when you can share an idea with a company and they'll say, well, don't, don't, don't tell me because, you know, you don't know what we're, all the things that we're doing. I don't want to, you know, you to later think you own this idea. So how many ideas are like that? Someone or a bunch of people have an idea. Maybe it's obvious. Like putting wheels on suitcases, putting wheels on luggage, but then someone executes on the idea. Maybe they get a patent or a trademark. That's what happened to Bernard Sato in 1970. He unscrewed four casters from a wardrobe and fixed them to a suitcase. Then he put a strap on his contraption and he wheeled it around his house. So he had invented the world's first rolling suitcase. So here's the question. Here's the question. Was the rolling suitcase his idea? Well, in 1972, he got a patent for the invention. So technically, it was his invention. But was it his invention? Now, this was 5,000 years before the invention of the wheel, one year after the first moon landing. The hamster wheel had already been invented. Was this his idea? Was it his idea? idea. And how is that different than was it his invention? And how does that work for you when you glean an idea that is your idea and you want that idea to be identified as your idea? Well, now a lot of things, technology, appear obvious in hindsight, wheels on a suitcase for one, but does it mean that it was obvious? Oh, that's so obvious. I thought about that. I just didn't do anything with it. How many times have, that, have you thought that? All right. 
So how does that change our idea of ownership or any collection of thoughts or ideas? Who invented the colored TV? Anyone want to take a guess at the year? Don't cheat by looking. We're looking for participation. Where, is it? Where are all the comments? Why are they not streaming? Anyone want to take a guess at the year that the colored TV was invented? Well, after my husband told me that a few people he knew had claimed to have invented the colored TV, I looked it up and here's what I found. Ready? In 1940, 23-year-old Guillermo Gonzalez Cameron patented a chromoscopic adapter with which black and white cameras of the day could capture color. And it was the first patent in the world for what they called a colored TV. So you can look and say, oh, this was the inventor of the colored TV, 1940. But wait, in 1925, Russian inventor Vladimir Zorkin filed a patent for a disclosure for an all electronic color television system. All electronic color, color television system. But in 1904, the earliest mention of a colored TV, a German patent for a colored television system, was issued. So neither of these color TV designs were um, successful, the 1925 or the 1904. Um, but they were the first documented proposals for color television. So if you Google who invented the color TV, guess who comes up? John Logie Baird. Why? Because the oldest surviving color TV in the world used a colored system invented by in 1937 by the Scottish engineer John Logie Baird. Now, that's just the oldest existing color TV in the world. So the system was invented. That's a weird way of looking at ownership or credit. The oldest surviving version of whatever it is you're supposed to have invented. Ah, hi, after watching. Welcome. Streaming in from YouTube. Welcome, welcome. All right. So what's ownership without credit? If no one knows you own an idea or you own the rights to say you invented something or came up with an idea, how do you know if you have ownership? And this is going to have huge implications for data in the future and all kinds of things. I mean, who owns, what do you own here? You know, what do you own on your phone? But it also will have huge implications, as you will see, for your mental well-being. So Ray says, coming up with an idea is easy. Making them happen is a lot harder. Even filing a, for a patent is a lot harder than just thinking of something. Some weight has to be given to the effort regarding ownership. Okay. I'm glad you did that. So uh, here's a completely different story about the suitcase with wheels. So I'm glad you said that because I think that's a, it's like you, you, you cued me up, Ray. You cued me up for this perfect coming back to the suitcase on wheels. Um, because there's a different ownership story and there's a completely different invention story because the normal way of thinking about it is, you know, e ideas are easy. Execution is difficult. Hmm. Maybe ideas or your ownership of ideas are um, stories that we tell each other. Because when mass tourism first took off at the end of the 19th century, Europe's large railway stations were packed with these porters and they would carry around the passengers luggage. But by the middle of the 20th century, there weren't very many porters left and passengers had to carry their own luggage. Obviously this is way before 1970. Okay. So we're talking about way before like the 1940s. So there were advertisements for all kinds of products that applied the wheel to the suitcase. And they can be found in British newspapers as early as the 1940s. These are not suitcases on wheels exactly, but they're a gadget known as a portable porter, a wheel device that can be strapped to a suitcase. Now, I totally remember strapping my suitcase to these wheelie devices like in the 1980s. I didn't have one of those two wheeled suitcases until probably late 90s. And even then it was like one of those two wheel things. It wasn't one of those casters that rolled around. All right. So, you know, so what happened? What, what about 1970? Well, in 1967, a woman in the UK wrote an angry letter to her local newspaper complaining that a bus conductor had forced her to buy an additional ticket for her rolling suitcase. The conductor argued that anything on wheels should be classified as a push chair. And she said, what, what would the conductor have done if she boarded the bus wearing roller skates? Would she be charged as a passenger or a pram, a baby carriage? So here's where the business books get this tidy takeaway story 
maybe a little wrong or maybe limited in our thinking. This whole idea of ideas are easy, it's execution that's difficult. Because suitcases with wheels existed decades before they were invented in 1972. But, and here's the hint, they were considered niche products for women. The market had yet to consider that a product for women could disrupt an industry, even make life a little easier for men. So maybe resistance to the rolling suitcase had something to do with missing perspectives. In this case, something to do with gender. It could be a lot of other things too. I mean, you miss perspectives and this. And Sato, the official inventor, described how difficult it was to get any U.S. department store chain to sell his luggage with wheels. Now, I know between 1972 and when I even saw the first luggage with wheels, you know, I didn't think about it when I first got my luggage. My, I think I got a set of luggage from my grandparents for graduation from high school. So he said at this time, this is the inventor, the guy who actually took the idea and executed. Okay, sure. He said there was this macho feeling that men used to carry luggage for their wives. It was a natural thing to do. So there are two assumptions here. And these particular assumptions happen to be about gender, but it could be a lot of other things, other perspectives. That number one, no man would ever roll a suitcase because it was unmanly. And the second assumption had to do with the mobility of women. There was nothing preventing women from owning a rolling suitcase. She had no masculinity to prove, but women didn't travel alone. The industry assumed, wasn't true, women did travel alone, but the industry assumed that why would a woman need a rolling suitcase? She's not going to travel alone. And if she travels, her man will carry her suitcase with her. So when Sadow invented or patented, it, he took, it took more than 15 years for the whole invention to go mainstream. So again, that you kind of have to push on some of these narratives that we tell ourselves. Ideas are easy execution. Well, we just put these, I mean, people file for patents all the time and they fight over little things and how they are awarded is massively subjective. So my grandfather used to talk about having an idea of attaching wheels to luggage way before, you know, 1970. He talked about attaching wheels to luggage. He was an inventor. So was he the first one to have this idea? No, probably not. I mean, he had, he did have patents for things like a, a type of scorecard that was on a golf cart and some railroad ties that use recycled things. He was an inventor. So here's the question. Another question. Do you have any ideas that you consider your own idea? Uh, maybe I test and I mean, I test and reject a lot of ideas. So I don't think I could come up with any idea that was truly my own. And I don't like admitting this to myself, but it's probably true. And there's all kinds of ways that you can show through trademarks and copyrights and patents that, you know, to document ownership. But what's the, what's the difference between having a sense of ownership over an idea and actually owning it? I mean, a legal document. And how much time have you spent, maybe a fleeting sense of ugh, where you had an idea and you're, you're aggravated, maybe for a minute, and maybe for a lifetime, that you didn't get credit for that idea. Not just that you didn't get the money from filing a patent and getting you know, residuals on your invention, but you didn't get credit for having what was your idea. If you have had any time in your life, a little or a lot, people give their whole lives to regret for not having been given credit for owning an idea. And by the end, in a few minutes, I think you're going to free yourself of ever having this angst. So Stephen says, more often than not, the difference between a sense of ownership and actual ownership is delusion. Brilliant. Ownership is storytelling. Whether it's the idea of something, we were there first. We don't have all the details of how humans spread throughout the world. We have hypotheses, they, they get debunked. But this idea of ownership is, I, that gets a yeah, rubber chicken, is perhaps a delusion. You know, in the United States, one of the, the, one of the companies that have you know, probably locked down this ownership concept um, 
for all kinds of things more than any other is potentially Disney. Because originally different kind of copyrights for like Mickey Mouse and some of these other things had maybe a 20 some year period. And when they started to come up for, um, you know, to come when they started to approach the time frame of coming onto the public domain, Disney lawyers who paid a lot of money to different kinds of politicians tried to extend the copyright for some of these properties. And then other companies were able to use the precedents that Disney sent, uh, set. But in 2024, we'll see what happens. In 2024, the Mickey Mouse copyright does finally run out. So what does this mean for the idea of Mickey Mouse? Well, do you have a derivative version of Mickey Mouse? Will it be your idea? Like, will you own it? So Mickey Mouse isn't just one idea. Next year in 2024, Steamboat Willie and the Barn Dance and that original design of the Mickey Mouse will enter the public domain in terms of copyright law. But that doesn't necessarily mean every version that you've ever seen of Mickey Mouse will enter the public domain. So even changing the kind of definition of what Mickey Mouse will be so that you can extend for this, but not for this, can have implications, all kinds of implications on idea ownership. If you have a new idea for Mickey Mouse, is it your idea? In 2006, Walmart tried to trademark that yellow smiley face that has been around since the 1970s, and it was denied. And the reasons that these trademarks are denied aren't so obvious. It's not just because they're totally ridiculous. Um, the New England pa Patriots tried unsuccessfully to trademark 19 to 0, a reference to having a spotless season. And they were not able to achieve the trademark, which was probably a good thing because two weeks later they lost the Super Bowl. So maybe they should have tried to patent 19 to 1. But Donald Trump tried to trademark, you're fired. That was also denied. Not because it was just ridiculous, but can you guess why that was denied? Anyone want to guess? Do we have enough participation to guess? Think about it in your mind, and I'll tell you in a minute. Think about it in your mind. All right? Well, the reason he was denied, it was because it sounded too much like uh, an educational board game called You're Hired. So it wasn't that, you know, you're fired had been used for, I mean, he didn't invent that. Um, Paris Hilton was able to get the copyright for that's so hot or that's hot or whatever. So, you know, there are some ridiculous things. My uncle Harry was in his 90s when he got a letter in the mail from some attorneys representing Warner Brothers telling him to cease and desist. Why? Because he was passing out cards that claimed that he was the original Harry Potter. Now, his name was Harry Potter. That was his name, birth certificate, long before J.K. Rowling came up with Harry Potter. Now, he did add a little wizard hat and some things to his business card, so he may be pushing the envelope. But did he own that name or did they? All right, so Abdurraja says you can copy it with no legal suit risk. So the legalities of these things aren't quite as clear as, as that. Um, because it depends on what you use it for. And we're not going to get into all the legalities of it because what we're doing here is how to think. Thinking about ownership and these ideas that you have in your mind that are your ideas, are they really your ideas? And once you realize that the idea, like Stephen said, of ownership is somewhat of a story, somewhat of a delusion, you can free yourself in incredible ways. All right. So I thought it was because of common phrase. No, that's not necessarily. I know I did too. If that's not some of these reasons that things are turned down are, are through kind of very, very legal red tape things that are not like the obvious. You can't just, you know, trade copyright a trademark a common phrase. So there's it's, it's very tricky. Like the law, you know, there's all kinds of things. This is not natural law. These are human made laws. So all kinds of different things. So have you ever heard a great thought or idea that inspires you to have a different thought or idea, a better idea, a worse idea? Isn't all work, aren't all ideas derivative, the work or idea of another person? I mean, my dog has even given me some ideas. So maybe it's not just the work of idea over another human. Again, good ideas don't care who they happen to. And many people, by the way, have claimed to have made that idea, that quote, good ideas don't care who they happen to as their own. But versions of that go way, way, way back to a lot longer back than you might think. Ideas are like contagious nesting dolls. Ideas within ideas. 
But the difference between a nesting doll that stays within a nesting doll is they also spread. They're like nesting dolls with viruses. So here's the idea, here's the idea of math I promised. Okay. Regular math is you give me an apple and I give you an orange. So we trade an apple for an orange. That means that you have an apple and I have, or I have an apple. We each have one piece of fruit. Basic math, one piece of fruit. But idea math is incredible. Idea math is incredible because if you give me an idea and I give you an idea, at the base level, we both have two ideas. But to the extent that ideas can be like viruses, I mean, sometimes good viruses, sometimes bad viruses, ideas that spread, it may be that by exchanging an idea for an idea, we each have a hundred ideas. If we give ourselves time to think about our thinking. So idea math is a beautiful thing, but the purpose of rethinking idea ownership, especially, um, especially ideas ownership versus ownership of other things, which is probably just as fantastical as idea ownership. Like I own this I own this property because I earned it, I paid for it, or I was here first, or I'm in possession of it, or my family owned it, or, you know, it's where I was born, you know. All of those, those six ideas of ownership, those are for things. But the idea of idea ownership is even more of a fallacy that hasn't been well addressed. And because we don't give ownership of ideas the deeper thought that it deserves, Beyond, monet beyond monetization, like Ray said, like, well, you know, ideas are cheap, but execution. But if we don't give these, because we've all probably had a feeling, fleeting, that was my idea. You know, maybe you tell a joke at a party and someone retells the joke. And you're like, that was my joke. And you have that, that angst. Or maybe you spend your whole life with regret that some idea you had was never attributed to you. But you'll never get that time back. And here's the deal. You never really own the idea in a way that justifies spending any time feeling regret or frustration. Good ideas don't care who they happen to. People have attributed that quote to Benjamin Franklin and many other people. But here's a new quote. Maybe it's my idea. Maybe it's not. That's a joke. I've never really heard it read, read it in brainy quotes. But good ideas, sure, they don't care who they happen to. But they don't even really know who they happen to, but you're free to borrow them for as long as you're here. So have a great week. Thank you for those who did participate and were here in the live stream. And if you are coming in later after the live stream, share your comments because this is our idea salon, our chance to talk about how to think with people who like this kind of stuff. So have a great week. See you next week.